Welcome to another episode of Literally Literary. We are here at the Gerald Nicholson Library on the Linfield College campus with evening supervisor Michael Bacchus. Michael, thank you for having us here tonight. It's my pleasure. We understand that there is a self-publishing discussion panel here tonight. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we have five panelists coming and all of them are self-published and they're going to be talking about that about the process they went through to self-publish, how they successful they were, things they could have done to do a better job, and things that they did right. So it is open to everyone, and it is free. So it's free education. So social media has been an area that's been growing quite heavily here at Linfield. And uh, so we will be running it live off of Facebook. You can go to the Linfield Live website and see it there. Um, we will also be live tweeting it. So if you follow us on Twitter with the hashtag Nick Reads, You'll be able to follow uh, our student social media as they live tweet it, and you can jump in that way as well. Once a month, we have an author that comes in and speaks. So just last Tuesday, we had the Erickson Lecture, and most of those events are being were live streamed, and therefore you can catch them on Facebook Live at that. They'll rebroadcast it, and it'll be up there for you to view at a later date and time. I look forward to everybody coming down, and if you're not, catching us on Facebook Live, and if you get this after the fact, then just go and view it then. Spread the word. We're at the self-publishing panel at the Gerald Nicholson Library tonight on um, Linfield College campus, and with us is Frank Listiandra, who organized this panel tonight. Uh, he's a filmmaker and author, wrote a book, uh, Jim Morrison, Friends Gathered Together. And Frank, thank you for joining us tonight for this interview. Can you tell us a little bit about your background as a creative person, a writer, a photographer, a filmmaker, and how you came to write this book about Jim Morrison? So I started taking pictures when I was really young, photographs when I was really young. It really, it, it was an interest that I had, sort of a passion at a very young age. And so I've continued to do that all my life. Um, I went to Michigan State University to be a photojournalist and realized that uh, I didn't w really want to work for a small city newspaper or um, probably any newspaper. I wanted to have mag magazine photographs printed in Look and Perry Mash and Life magazine. and. A uh, very small percentage of people ever get to get to that level, and so I went away for a while and came back and enrolled at UCLA to be a filmmaker, which um, was photography, but also was part of the thing I was doing about writing. Um, after UCLA, I um, went to into the Peace Corps because I didn't want to go to Southeast Asia and kill innocent people. And um, when I came back from the Peace Corps, some friends of mine had formed a band in Los Angeles called The Doors and uh, needed someone to edit a film. I was already pretty much a film editor by then. And so I became involved in the Los Angeles uh, pop music, rock music scene of the 60s through The Doors. And uh, Jim Morrison and I and Ray Manzarek, two members of The Doors, went to school together at UCLA. We were all in the film school. So it was a natural, you know, uh, I was a friend of theirs, they trusted me, and I had access um, to what they were doing, whether it was rehearsal, backstage, uh, on stage, and um, I didn't see myself as a rock photographer, I still don't, but I made a lot of uh, photographs of rock bands during those years because that's what was going on. I also made a lot of films, um, more than 25 documentary films about social issues, health issues, um, nutritional issues, and um, sort of gave that up in 1992-91. Um, I started going to Russia to deliver medical goods to hospitals and clinics in Russia with a organization in Santa Barbara called Direct Release International. I was a volunteer for them and um, decided I wanted to live in Europe, so I began to live in Italy. Um, 
and made a couple of films while I lived in Italy. And of course, now I live in wonderful McMinnville, Oregon, and um, I'm still a filmmaker. Matter of fact, I just finished a little film uh, interview um, with the owner of Third Street Books, uh, which hopefully will be uh, on your YouTube channel next week. So after having the self-publishing experience, which I decided to do um, from the ground up, I decided not to go to a vanity press, not to have someone design my book, um, just do it all myself. Because I wanted, I already had two books published by traditional publishers. And I decided that I wanted to know more about how a book gets to be bound and out there in a bookstore. And uh, so I took the self-publishing path uh, of uh, most abuse, let's call it. That is, I did everything. And um, it, was a, it was a process having to learn um, Adobe InDesign, for instance, which is a um, package of, of layout and design. But I did manage to learn that and laid out and designed my, my book, including the photographs and the cover and the back cover. And um, so having gone through that experience of self-publishing, I wanted other people to know the pitfalls, the potholes, and the, the good strategies to use in self-publishing. And uh, so I've talked to a lot of people about it. Steve and I talk about it often. Steve Long was on the panel. And um, we decided, he and I together, that uh, perhaps it would be nice to have a panel discussion um, about self-publishing. Um, my instincts are a bit more negative than other people's. And um, so what's going to happen tonight during the panel discussion, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't want to dash people's hopes who want to publish a book. But at the same time, I think they should have a reality check. Um, Ellie Gunn has been a friend of mine for many years, and I admire her tremendously. She's a great activist in the community, uh, a wonderful person. Uh, Karen, I didn't know. Um, Randy, I met because I, while I was going through the process of self-publishing my own book, uh, I called him up on the phone and he gave me an hour of his time um, making decisions or telling me about decisions that I needed to make and sort of guiding me in the right path. Uh, so I'm hoping that tonight's um, panel discussion will be uh, informative and useful to those people who have a manuscript and want, want to know what to do next. Can you tell us a little bit about the point at which you realized, I have these photographs, I have these experiences and I have these connections to these people and then that comes together alchemically to realize there's a book here. What, what presented itself to get you to the point that you realized there's a book here and this is how I'm going to do it? I had done a bunch of interviews with friends of mine who were friends of Jim Morrison. So this is the book Jim Morrison, Friends Gathered Together. And um, I had done it bunch of interviews with people I knew because I had a contract with Warner Books to do a book of photographs and I wanted to put some text in and I wanted to put some positive text in about Jim. He's a friend of mine, he was a wonderful human being, the most creative person I've ever met. Uh, so I did interviews with these people and that was uh, late, let's see, that was probably late 80s, mid 80s. And uh, the book was published by Warner, it was a successful book. And a couple of years ago, well, more than that now, maybe about four years ago, uh, three or four years ago, I uh, came across those interviews, which uh, by that time were almost 20 years old. I came across them in a box in, in my studio, and I said, what's in here? And I started looking through it, and I realized what they were, and I started to read the transcripts of those interviews I had done with all of our friends. And I realized that what I had done wrong with the Warner book was that I ex excerpted particular passages from each of these conversations, more conversations than interviews, and put them into the Warner book because I didn't have much space for text. Warner really wanted a book of photographs. And uh, as I read through these interviews, I realized that they were a, a, a oral history of a man, his time, and the music scene in Los Angeles that was invaluable because these people who I had talked to, had conversations with, were key players. Well, maybe not all of them key players, but they were all players in that world at that time, and they had a unique perspective, and they were articulate. And so it came to me that my obligation was, in fact, to, uh, in some way, get these conversations published. 
uh, how to get them published, and uh, the way I went about doing it um, was um, probably the most difficult way possible. I could have uh, issued them just as an ebook and saved myself a lot of time and trouble. But I wanted people to have a book in their hand and say, this is Jim Morrison, this is the guy he was, not the person we read about in the, in the magazines and newspaper and hear scandals about, that he was a considerate, kind, uh, generous human being who was also in, incredibly creative. And so my publishing these conversations was a gesture of saying, this is history, I need to have this history published. Uh, in some sort of way. I just took the longest way around to get there, the most difficult. I, I'm, I'm happy about it now, um, but I have warnings for people about publishing books that I hope to express this evening. Thank you for joining us tonight, Frank. Before you leave, I have one last question for you. Let's say suddenly a time machine appears. You're able to step into it, go back in time to any age, any time in your life that you want to, but you only have two minutes to step out walk up to yourself and impart some kind of information. My question is, what age would you go back to, what would you tell yourself, and why? Caroline, this is a very difficult uh, question for me because um, I've had a wonderful life. Each moment of my life, I think, is uh, a treasure for me. And, um, but if I had to go back to a period where uh, I think it's practical going back, I'd go back to a period when I was making films uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, living in Santa Barbara, and I tell myself these words, Nike, Microsoft, and Apple. Because those were the three stocks to invest in, whereas if I would have, if I would have been smart enough, or if I would have been adventurous enough, or if I would have known anything about investing, I would have invested some little bit of our money in those stocks, and now wouldn't have to think about how I'm going to earn money to live until I'm going to be 100 because that's a difficult road to hoe. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, Frank, and good luck with your panel. Thank you. We're at the Gerald Nicholson Library on the Linfield College campus for the self-publishing discussion panel this evening. And joining us is one of the panelists, Steve Long, who is a local author as well as the host of The Writing Light, a local television show that is on McMinnville Community Media, in which he interviews various authors who are local. And um, we kind of wanted to talk to you tonight, Steve, about this creative process. There's kind of a long... Uh, people who are not familiar with writing, they think you sit down, you write a book, and then you're done. And I mean, it's a long process. Could you talk to us a little bit about the point of conception, writing, editing, publishing, marketing? I mean, that's a long, broad arc there. Can you kind of tell us a little bit, what, what was the time frame for you like between the moment you decided to write your book and having it published? So, uh, the, the writing itself took the longest. Uh, and I think part of that was because I was really learning how to write. Um, and you make a lot of mistakes or you, or you, you, you have a lot of changes. Um, so for me, gosh, it was probably four years. Uh, and, and the writing part took three and a half of, or three of those. So uh, writing was the most. Um, but then there's, you shift gears and you, and you put on your businessman's hat and then that's the promotion and uh, we used to say you got to make it go away. How do you make it go away? And, and that's a, it's a, a whole subset of, of activity. Different authors have different processes and, and some people use book proposals, some do not. Most publishing houses want you to submit a book proposal. So what, what's your take on book proposals? Do you find them useful? I mean, did you, did you use one when you first wrote your book? Were you planning on selling it to a publishing house? Well, I sure was. Uh, book proposals really are mostly for nonfiction. So if you're going to do a novel, uh, they like to see the completed novel. If you're going to do nonfiction, then you submit a book proposal, and I think it, it lets the first the agent but then the publisher shape that form because they're looking at uh, how to market it. Uh, so book proposal, I would use a different word and to, uh, in fiction, um, more of a 
well, if this is fair, an outline because then it gives you direction. Uh, and so I did some of that. But a book proposal typically is nonfiction. Tell us a little bit about this uh, panel discussion tonight. What, what, what's it going to be like and um, how, how will it be uh, approached? And how did you end up being on this panel? Well, let me start with the last one. I, I uh, was asked to be on it by Frank Lisiandro. It's really his concept. And I immediately said yes. Uh, Frank is, has been both a traditional, traditionally published author and a self-published author. I've only been self-published. Um, but I think the tide is shifting. Self-publishing uh, has uh, just gained such validity. And people like Frank, as an example, who just see self-publishing, the advantage of complete control, uh, monetarily you might do better and so on. But we thought that with our various experience, we've got five people on the panel, all self-published, but all with very different experiences. And we thought between us, uh, maybe we could help somebody in the audience, shortcut some of that, or at least make the decision to self-publish, and once they've done that, kind of which path to pick. Steve, can you tell us if you have any new project coming up and are they, uh, is there some way that they're significantly different than your previous novel? Oh goodness, well a couple of things. <clears throat> um, I do have a completed novel. Uh, the protagonist of the second novel it was introduced in the first, so not that it's a sequel, but uh, uh, they're related. It's different I think in that that manuscript is actually with an agent now. And she hasn't accepted it, but uh, I have my fingers crossed. Um, I still would like to traditionally publish, uh, if it comes to that. I think it's a, a good book, I think it's a good story, and it will be published, one way or the other. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, Steve. Um, before you leave, I want to know, do you have any other um, speaker events or presentations you have coming up regionally at all? The only thing that's ongoing is uh, the show, uh, The Writing Life, and it's, it's just been so much fun. Actually, I have to say, Frank Lisiandro is involved in that as well, and he uh, has, has had a career as a filmmaker, and so he brings to this more than I ever could. Um, one of the things that we're starting to do is go on location, I guess that's the word, and uh, get out of the studio and go visit people in, in their environment. So that's ongoing. Um, I don't have anything else. Well, Terroir is coming up, 2017. I can't believe it. I think this is our seventh year. Um, so I hope to be involved in that. I'll certainly help with the organization. I haven't been asked to present yet, but we'll see. Your second book, All Hat, um, has to do with one of the characters that was introduced in your book there's a somebody. Yes. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about your first book and some of the characters and how that influenced you to write the second book? Sure. Um, well, in fact, this is the first book. There's a somebody. Um, these things are organic, or at least they are in my case. Uh, I knew the protagonist of the first book. I struggled with it because he does some bad things and, and tends not to be a, a likable character. And I actually, I wrote this in third person shifting, which is various people get to, to be the protagonist. Um, and I just felt that it was missing something. And I read uh, High Fidelity by Nick Hornby. And that's told in first person present tense. And I thought, that's the answer. That's what I w was looking for. And it was painful, but I cut out about 250 pages of the original manuscript and then added 100 pages back in first person. So that was tough. Along the way, uh, a character came into the book, uh, Owen Yonikut, and I just really like him. He's just a fun character. And in the original book, there's a period where uh, Owen is kicked out of the house. He's kind of a reprobate as well. And uh, he's missing from the scene for three or four weeks. The second book is those three or four weeks. It's that time period, right around Thanksgiving. And uh, I really like the book. Um, I think that there is a character arc. Well, he, he comes around and I think he learns something. Where in the first one, Jim does too, uh, but I think it may not be as obvious. 
but in any case, yeah, that's, and then I've started a third book that is completely different, uh, strictly third person, and they're um, uh, shifting time periods. So just in brief, it starts with a young boy, uh, and it seems to be his story, but his parents own a care facility, and there's an old man there, and they become friends, and then uh, the uh, old man story interplays with, with the young boy. So that's, that's the third one. So are you currently about how far into the third book? A hundred pages. Oh, really? Yeah. Ah, okay. So next year we should hear something about that. Well, I hope so. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's tough to find the time, but uh, I, I really like the book. I'm in a critique group. Uh, they think it's great, and I, I like that. That's great. Well, yeah. thank you for joining us today, Steve. Okay. Thank you so much. We are at the Gerald Nicholson Library at the Linfield campus for the self-publishing panel tonight. And with us is one of the panelists, Ellie Gunn, a local author. Ellie, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit, as, as a writer of both fiction and nonfiction, a little bit about the process? I mean, there's the conception, there's the writing, there's the editing, there's the publishing, and then there's the marketing. Can you talk a little bit about that process, and is it longer or shorter for nonfiction than it is for fiction? I didn't have any idea when I started writing the first novel, um, but I felt compelled to um, write a novel um, since childhood and finally kind of got to a place in my life where I had some time and I was going to Scotland for the first time and uh, very attached to my history of my family from Scotland and um, thought that would be an awesome way to write a novel, is to write about Scotland. So I started a novel, um, had some, developed some characters, um, got to a place where um, I, I wasn't a roadblock exactly per se, but it was like, why am I doing this? And writing a novel takes an incredible amount of energy <laughs> and patience. <laughs> and. Um, so I, what I did was I read a book um, about the Highland Clearances that took place in particularly 1813 in this very glen where that's called the Glen of the Guns back in the old days. So my, my ancestors have all been guns. And I thought, okay, that's what, that'll keep me going if I write about something that's really important. And so that's what I did, and that's, this is the first book. And it's... Um, takes place in this little river valley in 1813 with a family um, who suddenly realized that they're about to be evicted and the changes that they go through. I did a lot of research. A lot of the events in this book are really true things that happened, although I made up the characters that they happened to. So when I finished writing it, or in the process thereof, I went to um, a writer's conference in Portland I had a writing group, which was very, very important, which I would recommend to people to help give feedback. And then I went to a publisher um, in San Francisco who was a friend of a friend, and so I kind of had an in, and we had a glass of wine in this bar in San Francisco, and he said, well, it's a, it's a, he read the first three chapters, and he said, well, it's an interesting story, but I don't think anybody really cares about Scotland. So, you know, that was pretty hard for me, but I said, well, maybe if we declared war on, war on Scotland, it would be more interesting. And he said, well, yeah, there is that. We are at war now. And, but then I said, um, tell me the truth, because I was 66 then. I said, is it going to be difficult for me to find a publisher because of my age? And I told him how old I was. And he said, honestly, yes, that publishers are looking for young people or younger who are writing their first book which the publishers will promote and then will be expected to write a second book that will actually make money for the publisher and so I said well I can't really guarantee that and uh, so we said cheers <laughs> with our glasses of wine and I went home and at pretty close to that point I'd, I'd written to some editors um, had other people look at it, people thought it was compelling, but um, uh, one person says, well, you know, there has to be a lot of action 
And I said, well, it's mostly a story about people and where they live. So I, I just kept getting the idea that I wasn't going to be able to sell it to a publisher. And that's when I decided to publish it myself. So I did so with a, a publishing company, printing company in North Carolina, lulu.com. And I did a lot of my own marketing before I even ordered it to figure out how many copies I could order. And I had 250 orders, so I ordered 500. Um, and then I did things like had interviews in the newspaper, had a talk at the bookshop. I went to Highland Games all over Oregon. And because it's a Scottish theme, that's who I targeted my audience to be. And I ended up, this is the last copy, I ended up um, with, in all ordering 700 copies. And then I went back to Scotland and I took five, I think I took 10 copies with me and donated them to libraries in Scotland. <laughs> so that was really fun. So that was the, that was the first book. And then the second one is um, everybody said, well, what happened to everybody? Because I left them on the side of a cliff after they'd been made homeless, basically. So I had to go back to Scotland. So I went back for 10 weeks in 2013 and ended up with this book, which I intended it to be a series of short stories that I wrote in Scotland following up on the first book because I was right there where the people had been evicted and I could see what the scenes were like. I went to the places where they'd lived. Um, but then I ended up with a narrator who kind of stole, um, stole the limelight because <laughs> he's 22 and Canadian and he went to Scotland the same time I did to do a, almost exactly the same thing. Find out how his ancestors, which were the Murrays that lived in the same area as my ancestors, ended up in Canada. So that's how I did the second book, and honestly, I didn't even bother trying to find a publisher this time. I had another writing group, different people, and I had it printed locally here in Yamhill County, a woman named um, Gail Watson. And um, she, I sent her the PDF, she, and I told her what I wanted on the cover and the plaid, and she did all the work for me to do that. And then I ordered 100 copies, and um, then I've ordered 25 more and I have six left. So that's, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm totally satisfied with, with this. So how did you get to the process of being a novelist, of not mm -hmm. fiction, and I understand you're now writing nonfiction. I've written a memoir and I, I have that printed too. Um, while I was writing this book, I already had the memoir started. And I started that at a time when I had finished a lot of projects, I'd finished the first book. I hadn't gone back to Scotland to do this research yet, but um, I was remembering things in my life, which I think I hadn't started out thinking, oh, I'm gonna write a memoir. It was like, oh, I remember that time when this happened. And so I wrote that down on a piece of paper and actually threw it in a basket by the door. And I was working in the garden a lot. And by the end of the, the garden season, I had a basket of words which I ended up turning into a phrase and then a sentence and then a paragraph <laughs> and then several pages and finally um, it seemed like it was a memoir. So that's what I called it. And um, I had it printed here locally also and made my own covers and um, at this point I'm just going to give it away instead of try to sell it. I just have 20 copies and that's good enough. So when you, you, you wrote the memoir to kind of review your own life. Mm -hmm. So as a creative person, you're not just a writer. I mean, you're someone who actually, I mean, you, you made your me memoir in the hand-bound. Yeah. <laughs> I'm calling it third grade art <laughs> because I do colored pencil and um, I've been doing it for 15 years probably and I had a mandala coloring book and I had all these colored pages and I sort of thought, what am I going to do with all these? And that's part of the memoir, too. What am I going to do with all these memories and all these things I've done? And should I keep track of them so I remember what I did? Um, will my daughter, will my son, will my grandson um, wonder, what was, she, what was that all about when um, she got arrested at the Nevada test site? Um, 
she was a home birth midwife for 10 years. How did that work out? And she used to hitchhike all over the United States. I mean, what, <laughs> what was she thinking? <laughs> so I thought I better say what I was thinking and um, why I did the things I did and how they turned out. So as a creative person, I mean, uh, within our lifetime, mm -hmm. it's gone from being catalogs and periodicals and a microfiche to the internet, mm -hmm. now everything's Snapchat. <laughs> does, does this change in technology change the way you think about expressing yourself or the way you take in information? Has that any kind of long-term effect on you creatively? You know, I, considering that this first book I had printed far away, um, and this one I had printed locally, and the next one I hand-bound myself, basically. Um, I don't have any of these books on any kind of online um, forum. I don't have them on a Facebook page. I have a website with photos and the first chapter of this book. Um, I'm going backwards, I think, and I think that's kind of the message maybe for for um, people who are interested in writing. Well, what is your style? What, where are you comfortable? And, and do you want to put everything you write out there in the online community? Um, or do you want to be more introspective and um, control, to a certain extent, who reads what you've written? So I think that's the question for people today. So just one last question. Sure. I'm wondering if you, let's say a time machine just shows up mm -hmm. and you can step into it uh -huh. and it'll take you at any age you were in your life, at oh, any time, mind. any time you were in your life, Ooh. what age would you go back to and you get to step out and just impart like two minutes of information to yourself. So what time would you go back to? Hmm. What age were you? What would mm -hmm. you tell yourself and why? Hmm. Um. I'd probably go back to um, the time when I lived alone in a cabin in the foothills of the Coast Range and um, was probably living my life at the very most simple phase. I got water from a stream. I had a wood stove. Um, there was no one around. I was really by myself. And although at times I felt lonely, that was a really important time for me to sort out my past. and. Um, if I went back right there, I think I'd say, Ellie, this is just an amazing time in your life. Enjoy every minute of it. So you have to go get your water from a stream in the pouring rain. Go ahead and get it. <laughs> you'll, you'll appreciate water the rest of your life because of this. Well, thank you so much You're for welcome. joining us today, Ellie. We appreciate it, and good luck with the panel. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for doing much. this, Carol. We're at the Gerald Mickelson Library on the Linfield campus for the self-publishing panel discussion tonight, and joining us is one of the panelists, Karen Huntsberger, who had a book published about a year and a half ago, am I correct, right. called Waiting for Peace, in which you discuss the time during World War II that your father was actually stationed overseas, and he was, he was, uh, was he Army? Uh, Army Combat Medic. Can you tell us a little bit about this process of where you came up with the idea for this book, and then how you came about self-publishing it. Sure. Uh, the book came to be as a result of finding my dad's combat war journal. And he had uh, written quite descriptively about his experiences in his year overseas. And when I first read it, I thought it was the most compelling thing I'd ever read. And uh, then, a few years later, I found all the letters that were sent to him and from him during that same time period. And so I combined all those chronologically, and I still didn't have enough information, so I did historical research at the National Archives and got um, Army morning reports and unit histories to fill in what was actually happening in the war. Karen, I'd like to kind of explore the process of, of taking this idea. I mean, you, you have this idea, you have this information, so you're going to write this book. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of creating this book, and then at what point did you either go to a publishing house or did you decide, was there something in particular that made you decide, I'm going to self-publish this book? Yes, uh, the process uh, uh, occurred over a five-year period of combining, first I got the journal all entered and then the letters interspersed chronologically with them, 
and then doing more research and finding the unit army reports to put in there. When it was finally all combined, I started thinking about publishing, and I had been thinking about it all along. It took me two years to make the decision to even make it public because it's personal, it's my family's story, and not just my dad's story, but his parents, his brothers and sisters. Uh, four of the six children in his family served in World War II. So I first thought about going to Indiana U University Press because most of my family attended Indiana University, including my father when he was drafted. And I thought they might be interested in it. And I got discouraged there early on because of the elaborate process that one must go through with a university press. Page after page of page of requirements of what you had to do to prep it, to even give to them. Uh, so I got discouraged about that and started looking on the self-publishing line, also because I didn't want it to take until <laughs> 10 years from now. I wanted it to occur sometime in the, you know within the next couple of years. So I tried a, a, a traditional sort of self-publishing company first. I was very discouraged with them and then started looking at publishing companies in Oregon. Found a great website that listed many, many, many publishing companies in the state and found one that seemed to fit me. And I kept every now and then going back and looking and they still seemed to fit me and when I called them it was an immediate um, sort of um, minds thinking the same. So I enjoy very much working with them. Karen, can you kind of give us a little heads up of what we're going to be seeing tonight on this panel and how did you come about to be on this panel tonight? Okay, great question. All five of us that are on this panel have had different publishing experiences. And I was asked by Steve Long and Frank Alessandro to be on this panel. Steve I've known for a few years because he helped me uh, figure out how to do the Kickstarter campaign by which I funded the publication of my book. And Steve was super instrumental in helping me with that because he'd been successful in his own Kickstarter campaign. Uh, the panel tonight, I think because we have all published, done this so differently, but yet there's certainly some common themes of frustrations along the way, do's and don'ts, and certainly things we would learn from that and would, are happy to share with other people to maybe help them avoid some of the frustration. Well, I have one last question for you, just as we close off here. If a time machine just appeared right now next to you, and you were able to step into it and go back in time to any age you've ever been, and you're able to step out for two minutes and impart some kind of information to yourself, what age would you go to? What would you tell yourself and why? Hmm. Wow. I'd go back to 32. Really? 32 because it was a great year. It was before I had my son. Uh, my father, who the book's about, was still living. And he imparted lots of great advice to me. So in, I'd like to go back because I wasn't done getting advice from him. He died young at the age of 69. And uh, I think at that time period, you know, I would tell myself, your life isn't going to be what you thought it was going to be when you were 16 years old or even 12. But it's all been great. And one thing that the book has so changed my life, and that was one of the reasons I was afraid of publishing it, was I was afraid how it would change my life. And it's only been for the better. I've met all kinds of people that I would never have met otherwise. I've become a public speaker now. I given 25 talks to groups in com surrounding communities and even in other states about the book and the process and the story. Because ultimately to me it's, it's an anti-war story. That even though it's a story about World War II, my father became a pacifist as a result of his experiences and I want to carry forward his message. Well thank you for joining us tonight Karen and good luck with the panel. Thanks so much. We're at the Gerald Nicholson Library at the Linfield campus for the self-publishing panel tonight. And with us, talking to us, is Randy Staples, a regional author. You've written books, uh, both fiction and nonfiction, that kind of cover the Oregon-Idaho area pretty much, haven't you? Well, pretty much nonfiction, uh, and, and doing that for quite a while, beginning to come up on, on 30 years of doing that. My first one was in 1988 over in Idaho and since I've been in in Oregon for the last 12 and a half years I've, I've done some Oregon related uh, publishing as well and some that, that really kind of fits outside of state boundaries and just kind of uh, you know, our, our general subject matters as well. 
How did you come to be on the panel tonight? How did you find out about it? Well, they found me. Uh, the other the other people on the on the panel uh, ran across uh, had run across some of the things that I was doing. Uh, I, I'm I'm fairly familiar with some of the people at the News Register, the New McMinnville newspaper. And so were they, and and so conversation kind of went back and forth. In fact, one of the books that I've done, I co-authored with uh, with the uh, managing editor of the News Register, and another book uh, that I published was written by one of the columnists for the News Register. So I have some connection there. They did, and, and so we kind of got together on this. One thing a lot of authors, particularly younger authors who are just now becoming familiar with this self-publishing phenomenon. Uh, talk a little bit about this process, it, the conceiving an idea, writing it, editing, rewrites, all the way through the publishing and marketing. I mean, that's a quite a large arc there. Well, there's, there is a lot to do. There's, there are many stages toward getting a book out and published, and most people simply think and speak in terms of writing the book. And certainly, writing a book is a is a substantial project, but it's only one piece of of what you need to do. If you're going at it properly, the the conception of it, the planning on the early stages, involves really a great deal more than just the actual sitting down and writing of a book. And on the other end, the 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 aspect of marketing it, getting the getting the book out to the world is I've, I've told a number of authors over the years at least as intensive, at least as uh, labor intensive and, and broad a piece of work as the writing of the book itself, the writing and edi editing of the book. The writing and editing of the book, that whole phase of it is really only one half of the work or less. Uh, there's a whole lot else that needs to be done as well. So Randy, can you kind of talk a little bit about the concept of a book proposal? Some people use them, some people don't, some publishing houses want you to have one. Can you kind of talk about that process there? Well, just about all, all publishing houses that, that are going to publish a book for you are going to want a, uh, some kind of a book proposal. And that will usually include everything from, of course, what kind of material will be in your book, if it's nonfiction, where it came from, whether you have the rights to it, things like that. Uh, and they also want to know very clearly how it can be sold and, and what your plan is for getting it out in the marketplace and, and so forth. A lot of people who approach uh, publishers, traditional publishers, with the idea that I wrote the book, now they can figure out how to sell it, uh, are in for a big surprise because most of the work, unless you are already a brand name publisher and they didn't get to be brand name publishers just by sitting in their, in their office and never showing their face to the world, but unless you are a brand name author, uh, a, a big well-known personality, uh, you're going to have to do a lot of work to get your book out there in front of people one way or another. It can be online, it can be in person, it can, there are lots and lots and lots of ways to go at it. But there is a lot of work that even if you are traditionally published, you are going to have to do. It isn't simply a matter of sitting back and expecting that the publisher will take care of it all and design it all. You'd need to work out a lot of those details yourself. The difference between that and, and, and self-publishing, actually, is that you need to do all of these kinds of things, but it doesn't necessarily have to be lined out in quite the same kind of way. You're not necessarily doing this as a, as a written product to show to somebody else. You're doing it as a guideline for yourself to show yourself, this is what I need to do, this is what the book will consist of, this is my plan for it. Uh, as, as we go through the process. So one way or another you're going to have to do something like a book proposal. The only question is whether it's going to be something that you're going to show to a publisher who does that kind of work for a living or whether it's something that you're going to use yourself as a guideline for what you are going to do. So in the process of becoming a self-published author, there's a lot of, of learning as you doing. What was the first book you self-published, and since then, what would you have done differently? Well, the most recent book that I, that I published is actually about the whole question of how you go about marketing books, distributing them, and so on. It's called What Sells Books. And 
where I started with that was to describe what I did and what the process was like when I did my first book. I self-published my first book with some help from other people that I knew in the community who had, who had similarly done that. And there weren't nearly as many of them back then in 1988. So this was pre-internet, this was almost pre-personal computer, not quite. Uh, but it was pre-Windows, pre-email, uh, uh, before a lot of the things that we take for granted now could be done. And the world was a lot, a lot different in terms of book publishing. There were far fewer books published then than there are now. Uh, at that time, the estimate was that there might have been around 35 or maybe 40,000 books published worldwide per year. Now the number is estimated at somewhere close to a million a year. It's, it's uh, an entirely different kind of world, and in terms of marketing the book, it's altogether different. Then you could rely on being able to get your book into, if you, if you acted in a, in a reasonably professional manner, you could get your book into a, a number of at least regional bookstores. Uh, the time was then, back in the 80s, early 90s, when I had no trouble at all just walking into Powell's bookstore in uh, downtown Portland with a bunch of books under my arms. I'd hand them to them, they'd write me a receipt, and they were on the shelf. And those days are long gone. <laughs> you can't do it that way anymore. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of other ways to go about selling books now. There, you can, there are a lot of online options. Tremendous numbers of books are sold online. Most of mine are sold online now. <clears throat> Many more than, than, in, than in other ways. And probably the next largest uh, number of ways that I sell books is just person to person in terms of, of uh, individual events and, and uh, seeing people and, and so on. And bookstores are a much smaller part of the equation now, unless you're, uh, once again, uh, a very well-known author with a, with a national uh, kind of distribution network. Uh, bookstores are not the kind of approach that, uh, that they once were. They can be very good for visibility. They can be nice to have a presence in if you can, if you can get in. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. It's much iffier than it used to be. But uh, the world has changed a lot, and in fact, the, that was a large part of the reason why I wrote that book, which was uh, uh, what sells books, uh, was so that I could get caught up on some of the things that, were, that are changing. And the good news is that there are a tremendous number of tools out there for those who are ready to use them. Well, thank you for joining us here tonight, Randy. I have one last question for you before we leave. If a time machine showed up, and you were able to step in and go back in time for two minutes, any age you've ever been in your life, what age would you go back to, what would you tell yourself, and why? Well, as far as book publishing is concerned, I guess I'll just limit myself to, to that area. Uh, as far as book publishing is concerned, I guess I would have, uh, have uh, heeded some advice that I heard from another self-publisher back in, I believe it was 1995, uh, who came over for dinner at our house and and was telling us about this interesting thing that he just discovered on the then brand new World Wide Web. It was, it was uh, this place called Amazon.com that was starting to sell some books and he thought that had some potential. Well, uh, I thought, I, I didn't disagree, I thought that it did too, but uh, I think that what I might have done at the time might have been to get... Uh, <laughs> Might have been to take a trip to Seattle and, uh, and and start to get seriously into that at that stage, had I but known. Ah, well. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, Randy, and good luck with the panel. Okay, thank you.